take this pen and just draw some little lines. And it was invisible. It was just a clear adhesive, but it would give that texture because some people, they say, scratch the shirt. It's feeling for the texture on the, uh, the shirt of the bill. Hey, this is Matt Cox. I'm going to be interviewing Jeff Turner. Uh, I interviewed Jeff probably maybe three to uh, maybe three to six months ago. Might have been longer. Anyway, uh, I uh, he's a, a credit card or a credit card counterfeit. He's a he's a counterfeiter of U.S. Uh, notes, and um, basically we're going to just kind of uh, talk about prison and the halfway house and what's been going on with him lately. He's got some interesting things that are happening since he was on the program. And I thought, I, I mean, I'm interested in what's going on with him and how things are progressing for him since he got released. And I thought maybe a lot of you guys would be too. So check this out. All right. So like I was saying, so basically, you know, like, I mean, obviously I know this, but anybody who hasn't watched this, like, why did you, uh, why'd you go to prison? Like, can you give us the the three minute or do you have a five minute version or a three minute version or um yeah well uh basically i you know struggled with drug addiction for a long time um ended up losing my job uh you know i had a wife and kids and the whole deals functioning addict going to work every day i lost my job so i basically just kind of started printing hundred dollar bills to uh <laughs> you know, get out of that situation. And it kind of spiraled out of control a little bit as far as like, I was, I didn't intend on like printing as much as I did over the course of, you know, as long as I did. Um, it was kind of just like a, I was thinking I'd do it for like a month, rack up some money, get a, get a new house and until I found a new job, but it kind of, uh, you know, the bills ended up just being so good and so easily spendable that, uh, you know, over the course of like, I'd say 18 months, maybe two years, uh, I printed, you know, close, close to a million dollars. I'm not sure the exact amount. Um, and yeah, so I was eventually set up by a drug dealer that I was selling uh, fake hundred dollar bills to, you know, the Secret Service raided my hotel room. Um, and after cooperating with the Secret Service, giving them a uh, like explaining how I was to do how I did everything. Um, they wanted me to make a training video for secret service agents, uh, as far as like my counterfeiting techniques and stuff. Um, so I made a, made a couple bills on camera for them and, uh, it reduced my sentence from like three years down to, uh, the range of 10 to 16 months. And they gave me the low end of that at, at 10 months. So I'm really lucky with how all that worked out. Right. And so you went to, you ended up going, where'd you go to prison? Where'd you go? Uh, the prison I went to was FMC Lexington, which is, uh, it's like a, it's a federal medical center, but because of COVID, um, they basically stopped like transferring patients to the medical center. So they basically, it's just like a low security federal prison basically, but it was FMC Lexington was where I went. How was that? It was, uh, I mean, it wasn't bad. It's not really, this is the first time I've been to prison. So it's not exactly what I expected prison to be. Um, was you know it, what I mean? Was it a low? Or yeah, a... It, was, it was a low. Well, technically it's, it's, it's a, it's a administrative low. So it can house like low, medium and highs, but for right. the most part, it's just a low. I mean, you know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, like Yazoo is a like they have like a, a a low at Yazoo, but it's for like administrative like punishment. It's a shitty, shitty low. Yeah, um, I mean, like it's much worse than the low at Coleman. I've heard Coleman is all right from yeah. some people. No, it, um, yeah, that's what I'm saying. Coleman's great. Like it's not like a, <laughs> not like the low at Coleman. You you go to Yazoo and it's you know it's it's a much rougher low. Yeah. So. Um, but you were there, so wh how was that? How was your first day in uh, Lexington? Uh, well, t going into it, we it was still under quarantine, like the COVID. I, I was kind of at the back end of the whole COVID restrictions. So you had to quarantine for your first 30 days in, 
and quarantine for the last 30 days out. Um, so basically like, but yeah, it's, it's not really what I expected. Um, you know, what really. The, well, I'm sorry. What was the quarantine? Was it like, in, did you go to the shoe for the quarantine? Yeah. Or, oh, okay. But the shoe was, uh, like it was basically just kind of like a, a bus stop. You know what I mean? Like if people know what that means, like, uh, just like kind of bunk beds kind of thing. Um, in like a big room and all of us just couldn't leave the room. Oh, okay. Basically. All right. You know so that's not a bus stop is right. Like in the units, it's kind of like where all the bunk beds and stuff are. Yeah. They call that like in Coleman, they call them the fishbowl. Um, okay. But yeah, no, when I meant the shoe, I meant like the hole, you know, in the, you know. Well, yeah, it was basically like the, the it was the shoe, but they kind of just kept the doors open because it oh. was full of quarantine. So it was like this, basically this really small unit that just we couldn't, couldn't leave. <laughs> how many people are, in, how many people are in Lexington? I want to say it was like maybe. 2400 or something man that's Maybe. big yeah. i'm not sure exactly yeah i, I think want to coleman, say something like that yeah coleman's like 1800 to 2000 roughly so yeah. that's a big that's a um yeah that's a big uh a big facility so so you were there how long how long before the you uh i was only there i was only in the prison for like six months because, um, you know, I did the uh, a month in Knox County Jail, um, a month in Blunt County Jail, a month in uh, London, Kentucky at like the federal holding facility there. And then from London, they, they brought me to Lexington. Um, so and I, I did a few months in Knox County before all this on state charges that were eventually dropped um, before the feds picked it up. But but yeah, Was I, that I, I, I like I was one of the few guys that literally like, as I was coming into prison, like I, you know what I mean? I only had six months left. <laughs> yeah. So. Yeah. It's not worth unpacking. Really, yeah. It wasn't that, that bad for me, honestly. Um, you know, cause I, you know, you're in there with people doing 10 more years and whatever. Um, but yeah, six months wasn't, wasn't too horrible. <laughs> Could have been worse for sure. Um, how long so, did you end up doing? You did like 12 years or something like that? Yeah, I did. I was, I, I would say 13. I usually say like 13 because it was like, it was just shy of 13. It was like 12 and 10 months or something. So it was, yeah, it was basically 13 years, you know. Um, Yeah, but yeah, it was all right. <laughs> you know, I mean, once... It, once I got out of the medium, it was, you know, it's just, you know, you get into a routine and then you're just whittling away time. And that's the, that's the worst of it, that keeping yourself occupied, you know, trying not to think about the outside world. And, you know, like for you, like you got, you, you know, you have a, what you have a wife and kids. Uh, well, an ex-wife now, but ex -wife, yeah, right. at the but time. But still that. That it's harder for somebody who has a wife or, you know, it's, it's harder for somebody who has people out there than it is for yeah. somebody who doesn't like, I didn't have anybody really out there that I was, you know, you know, desperate to get out to because there just really wasn't, I mean, they were there, but they basically, you know, had walked away from me at that point. So there was just, it wasn't yeah. like, you know, oh, my wife's struggling to to take care of my, my three kids or, you know, there was none of that. So it wasn't, you know, those are the guys that are, are just in hell or the guys that are, you know, calling their wives, you know, well, you know, where were you last night? I called last night. Why didn't you answer? You know, that, you know, it's like, those guys are miserable. That's the yeah. worst. That's yeah, I, I was lucky I know all about that. Yeah. I was lucky. Everybody gave up on me. <laughs> <laughs> so well, you, you got into like writing, writing stories and stuff while you were like, yeah, I started up. writing my stories, but, but, um, and that, that, but that definitely, that absolutely helped me because it got me into a routine. It got me focused on something. It gave me a purpose, but like, you know, same thing with, but different than with, as far as with you, you, you know, you didn't have time to do anything like that. You basically, mm -hmm. what you probably just read the whole time you were there. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. I, you know, worked out, shot pool 
and read read books really <laughs> that's that's about all there was to do yeah i ended up getting a job in the kitchen which sucked uh at first doing like dishes and pots and pans mm -hmm. which is like just a miserable job but then like basically nobody wanted to do that job and I didn't either, but like the CEO, uh, the guy in the kitchen basically was like, oh, I'll give you the, the highest pay grade if you just keep doing this. Plus, I had like the little hustle of, you know, bringing back chicken and peppers and onions and stuff to the, the unit. So I was able to actually get by pretty, pretty well. You know what I mean? Making like yeah. probably three to five flat books a, a day. You know what I mean? Working in the kitchen, which. Yeah, you know, so that's like that's. 20 bucks 30 bucks a day yeah plus plus mention. like the the hundred dollars they paid me every you know whatever month, month whatever. yeah did you have frp um restitution I, yeah I, I did but i they never I, I don't think they ever ended up taking it out because you you don't have to do it for the first or no i think they took it out once or something because like they they don't take it out for the first three months or something like that Law enforcement often questions him, not because he's suspected of a crime, but because they find him fascinating. He is the most interesting man in the world. I don't typically commit crime, but when I do, it's bank fraud. Stay greedy, my friends. Support the channel. Join Matthew Cox's Patreon. So yeah, I think I ended up like paying 80. I think they took like one of my paychecks one month or something. But I was since I was bringing in peppers and onions to the unit, chicken, all that stuff. Like, yeah, I was basically getting by on on the stamps that I was you know, making. And the store man. I wasn't I didn't run a store. I, I would just everybody knew that I was in the kitchen and I had, you know, you you get these big boots because I was in the dish room. So, like, I just stuffed them, you know, put the chicken in bags, peppers, onions, bag them up and just put them in my boots. And I just walk out of the kitchen with these big ass rubber boots. And and the guards knew what I was doing. Like, they didn't. Yeah. You know, they they don't really care as long as you just. You know, do your job and keep it on the down low and stuff. Um, So. So what when did you get put in for halfway house? Well, they they denied my halfway house. Oh, because. Mm hmm. Cause I didn't have like enough time, I guess, or something, you know what I mean? I was only there for like six months. So, um, so yeah, you, didn't have, just, you didn't have any halfway house, not, no, not in like the mandatory federal halfway house. When I, when I got out, you know, I came to a sober living house cause my wife and I divorced while I was in prison. So I couldn't go to my, you know, my house. <laughs> like I, I had a wife and kids in the house. But that was in North Carolina. <clears throat> so when we separated, the feds basically were like, we have to release you back to Knoxville, Tennessee, because, you know what I mean? That, that's your sentencing district. So I basically right. got dropped off, you know, took the bus into Knoxville. <clears throat> I had like, I think like 600 bucks on me or something getting out of prison. So And they yeah. said, contact your probation officer in the next, <laughs> two, in the next 24 or 48 hours. Yeah. And much. that was it. What'd you do? So you, you, did you already have it arranged to go to the sober living? Um, no, I, I went and stayed like my parents live close to Knoxville, like an hour outside of Knoxville. So I stayed with them for like a week or two until I, I could get into a place. Um, so yeah, but it's not bad really. It's just like, I'm on probation. I get the whole drug tests and everything anyway. And, and the sober living house is basically just like, you know, you pay, pay your rent, pass your drug tests kind of thing. And that's it. So, you know. All right. Can you come and go? With you want? Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's not, it's not even considered like a halfway house. It's just a sober living house. It's just like cheap rent. As long as you stay sober kind of thing. Right. Uh, so, so why? Yeah, not that much. Um, so where'd you work? Thank you. Where did um, you work when you first got out? Well, after I was out for probably like a week or two, I stayed with my parents for like a week or two. Then I got into this house in Knoxville. I moved there and uh, like literally the first place I applied to, um, it was for a print shop, which um, 
you know, that that's like the field that I've been in for years was like the sign business and printing and graphics and vinyl and car wraps and stuff like that. So I applied to this one, the first place to do this print shop and they, they hired me right away. So it worked out and, and that ended up being a great job that I, you know, I still work at. So I've been working there for about a year now. I've already been like promoted to a production manager. I basically run production at this print shop and they're, they're good to me there. So. Okay. Well, yeah, that's funny because you had told me that, um, you know, that after you did the podcast and everything that, you know, you were a little concerned and then they like, <laughs> they saw the podcast and they're like, wow, that's pretty, you know, that's actually pretty amazing. So, yeah. Um, I, I think the owner said that he thinks they were uh, underutilizing my my talents, is what he said. <laughs> so I got I got a raise and a promotion after. <laughs> um, so how did you get in touch with me? Like that because you were uh, you had written me. Had did you contact me in the text or you wrote me at, at you wrote me? I mean, did you contact me in the in the um? comment section or did you i thought you think you sent me an i know we started emailing and then we talked on the phone yeah i, I think i messaged you on facebook maybe oh okay i i, for, I, I forget that. you said wasn't it like a friend of yours told you to contact me um well no i've, I've seen uh <clears throat> excuse me i've seen your uh like concrete uh, podcast before I went to prison, actually. And I saw like John Boziak's, um, which I was telling John on, on our interview, um, that I read, I, I watched Boziak's concrete and then I went to prison and I, I didn't know his name or anything. I just watched the, the interview. And then I go to prison and read that book Kingpin. And I thought it was about him. Oh, you know right. I mean? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I remember this. Right. Yeah. So, when, I don't know. Basically, when I got out, like I was just had nothing to do scrolling through YouTube. I just stumbled across your stuff again. So I just like sent you a message. <laughs> I was, you know, what I mean, like I just was like, hey, I just got out of prison. What, you know, you seemed interested. So whatever. We talked on the phone. Um, yeah, I was I remember I was I was interested because, you know, after like 12, 13 years in prison, I had met maybe four or five counterfeiters and really only like two of those counterfeiters were real counterfeiters. You know, yeah. like you always have the idiot who's just making, you know, stupid bills. He gets caught right away. He ends up mm -hmm. having to go to jail. Like he, he, he never really passed any <laughs> real bills. Like it just didn't, he wasn't a, a professional about it. And then I'd met two other guys that were really knew what they were doing. And so when you said, you know, I'm a counterfeiter. And then you explain that, look, I was supposed to get this much time, but they reduced my, they were willing to reduce my sentence. If I showed them the, the technique I was using, I thought, oh, well, this guy knows what he's doing then. Like that, that's not something they're going to do for just anybody at all. So, you know, and that's what I remember spark, just sparked my interest. I was like, oh, this fucking guy's got a story. Like there's no fucking way that the feds cut his, cut his sentence just for him showing them the you know his, his, the actual technique that he was using so uh yeah and then i thought then you did you came on you had a good story and then yeah you you flew down here to see your your buddy or your cousin or something uh just to see old friends and i i had a court date a child support from my first child down there too um so yeah i was i was basically after i talked to you i was already planning or before i talked to you i was already planning on going down there um so then, you know, when you said schedule, uh, you know, you want to schedule it, I was like, well, that's perfect. You know what I mean? Yeah. So you came here. We did a we did an interview. That was the first interview you you'd, you'd done. And yeah. then after I, hearing your, huh? I was gonna say I was a little like nervous or something on your interview. I didn't really know, you know, never yeah, been, I, even been on camera before or anything really. Well, and 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 honestly, like I I wasn't. I, I remember thinking. Like after you did mine and then you did, you did ended up doing Boziak's. Um, I just remember thinking that I, my interview with you was like so bad. Like I could have really <laughs> dug in, 
but you know, a lot of stuff you were saying, I was just kind of like just listening to you talk. So I wasn't really digging in and asking really, I, I think I did a really horrible job interviewing you. Um, but then, so after I talked to you, that's when I, I remember right after hearing your story, I was like, this is a fucking good story. This is, this is super, super unique, super interesting. And that's when I, that's when I called Danny from concrete. And I told the same, same thing to Danny. I said, listen, man, I met like maybe four or five counterfeiters in 13 years. Two of them were actually professionals. So I've met two credit, you know, two, that's how rare it is. I've met two counterfeiters. And I said, you gotta, you gotta talk to this guy. And then you, you went over there, what that night? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Just yeah, a few hours know. after your house. And you were interviewed by Dan Danny in Concrete, and then it, then how long was it after that 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 you were you were contacted by like a producer or a screenwriter? Um, yeah, it was probably like a month, a month later, maybe. Um, pretty pretty soon after, maybe a few weeks. Um, I mean after after the podcast came out, yeah, I started getting like 10, 20, 30 messages from just like people every day like right um and one of them was this guy tom who like i think he he set up a facebook account just to get in contact with me because it was like there was no profile picture he had zero friends kind of thing um, right but he he messaged me uh i think i forget what he said I, th I think he was like oh i'm a screenwriter i saw you on a podcast i'm interested in talking to you about your story or something so i just um you know he gave me his email I, we started emailing back and forth um and then he, you know he wanted to talk on the phone so he three-way called me with uh the director alex and we kind of just talked for like three or four hours i told him my story and then we just kind of <clears throat> you know bullshitted about stuff for a while um <clears throat> And then, like within a couple weeks after that, yeah, he basically offered me the the life rights option or whatever. Email me the contract. Um, right. Uh, you so. contacted. That's when you contacted me, and you were like, "Hey, mm -hmm. this is what's going on." Um. Yeah. So they optioned it for for like twelve months. Is that right? Or was uh, it eighteen? An eighteen month option with a twelve month. Uh, They've got extension. Extension, yeah. They they can extend it for twelve months. Yeah, if they're in negotiations with uh with a production company, right? Yeah. And so, so, is it Tom? What's Tom's name? Tom Gronenberg and Gronenberg. Alex McLean. Right. So Tom wrote the. He just finished the screenplay. Mm -hmm. And it sent it to you. You said you've read like half of it so far. You said it's pretty good. Yeah, it's it's good for sure. I mean, they're they're professional writers, you know. What I mean, so, I mean, so you, you, know, you probably sound like not, a, like a, like a superstar, right? Like you're like, you know. <laughs> well, it, I mean, <laughs> the story is based on like I only read half of it because they just uh, emailed it to me like three days ago, um, so I'm not even done reading it. But you know, from what, what I read, it's it's good. You know what I mean? That like well, obviously the names are changed. The story isn't like exactly how it went down, but the whole gist of everything is is pretty accurate. He's been known to cure insecurity just with his laugh. His organ donation card lists his charisma. His smile is so contagious. Vaccines have been created for it. He is the most interesting man in the world. I don't typically commit crime, but when I do, it's bank fraud. Stay greedy, my friends. Support the channel. Join Matthew Cox's Patreon. Well, you know, what they're trying to do is get the spirit of the story. The, the problem is, is that if you were to write a book and it was 300 pages, that's like 20 to 25 hours of screen time. So mm -hmm. they have to try and say, hey, here's we got a 20 hour or 20 to 25 hours worth of screen time that we have to condense into less than two hours. like. And people are like, well, why don't they just do the real story? Because the real story is a is a fucking it's a 20 part series. Yeah. Like they yeah, can't do sure. that. They're trying to get a they, they want to make a film. So they're going to try and condense it. And, and so some scenes 
And it's funny if you've ever read like uh, Frank Abagnale's book, you know, Catch Me If You Can, and then saw the movie, like it's really, really close. They remove a lot of stuff, but mm-hmm. some scenes they actually kind of combine two, two or three scenes together. Yeah. So you watch the movie and you're like, that never happened. And then you kind of go, well, actually, that did happen, but he was behind a motel. And that part of it happened, but that was actually not an FBI agent. That was, you know what I'm saying? So you start kind of going, they kind of put m- multiple stories together and some they just leave out. So, you know, it's like, it, that's why it's always kind of based on, um, yeah, you yeah. know, based on the story. But like in uh, Catch Me If You Can, I remember <clears throat> the book goes into like a lot of detail about when he was in prison in France and like the whole, remember? Yeah. Um, in the movie, it was just like, it just kind of showed him sickly, <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. It didn't really go into like the solitary psychological aspect like the book did, but. But they, they did cover a lot of great parts that, you know, they covered like him escaping from the plane, mm-hmm. you know, they covered him being, in, you know, passing the, passing the bar and being with the girl, the chick and her father worked for the, he was a U.S. attorney and. I'm sorry. Uh, he was a, a district attorney in New Orleans, and he he escapes. Like, like there's there's tons of stuff that it's it's very much rooted. The spirit of it is rooted in the, in the story. Uh, so yeah, I wouldn't I wouldn't mind taking a look at 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 the screenplay if you know if you if you ask you know Todd and them if if I you know um, you know if they're okay with it. If not, that's fine too. Like sometimes they get super concerned. Um, you said that, didn't you say they were they were talking about possibly doing a, a sizzle reel? Um, I think I think he wants to um, here soon. Like that, the the copy of the script that they gave me is just the first draft, so they're still like busy working with stuff. Um, and you know, I don't like talk to them every day about it. You know what I mean? It's kind of like a once a month thing. We'll just kind of email back and forth real quick, but um. I think he's going to put put together something. I'm not sure if you know how or what it's going to be, but right. Have Did you your, optioned your, your your life rights yet, or are you going? No, to? no. You know what happened was like when I got out of prison, I was <laughs> contacted by a bunch of people, right? A bunch of different production companies, and I didn't. You know what I did was they would contact me, and I didn't pursue them. Because because my fear was that if I did my story, then all these other stories that I had written would never really be taken seriously, if that makes sense. Because so, you know, Jordan Belfort, they did the Wolf of Wall Street. And after the Wolf of Wall Street, you know, he, he'd ri- he'd written a best selling book that was turned into a movie. So he turned around and tried to get a couple. He pitched several series of different types of series that he also was interested in that he, he had co-written or written, but nobody took him seriously because he walked into the boardroom and they looked at him. They're like, Oh man, you're Jordan Belfort. You're the Wolf of Wall Street. He's like, yeah, yeah, I, I get it, but I'm, I've written this series and I'm trying to pitch this series and it, it never took off because nobody can really, he was typecast as the Wolf of Wall Street. And I, I was concerned that that might happen. In retro in retrospect, I probably should have pursued those uh you know those opportunities. But what had happened with me was I got I ended up getting a, a several meetings with uh, Blumhouse Productions out in LA, and they make a bunch of series for like um, Hulu and Netflix. And we had a bunch of meetings, and I was actually supposed to fly out. And this took place over the course of three or four months, maybe six months. And I was supposed to fly out to L.A. and meet up the whole crew and negotiate a contract with them. And two weeks before I was supposed to fly out, COVID hit. Mm. They shut down their their offices. Um, then it became then it became, well, you know, we need to figure out what's going on. Then months and months went by. We had a couple more meetings and ultimately it just felt fell apart. So. In the meantime, I ended up pitching uh, John Boziak's story, and that got picked up. And we optioned his life rights. I 
I then optioned uh, another guy, Pete Rossini's uh, life rights that uh, to a production company. And then I started working with a, a podcast company on, on a bunch of my stories. So like everything was going well, but you know, so, so once everything started going well, I decided what I was going to do was start kind of working on my stuff. So I'm working with a production company right now in uh, the UK to try and do like, a, they're going to do like a feature, uh, po a feature documentary on my story. And of course, if that happens, then it's, 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 it's a stepping stone towards getting either a series or a film made about you. And right now it's perfect for a, a, or a documentary about my life because we're slowly starting to go into another recession. And so that's kind of, you know, it's kind of, it, it kind of feeds into the whole housing crisis recession thing. So so that's where mine's at. But uh, but yeah, I remember we were talking and you were saying that they were thinking about doing a sizzle reel. They're still working on their stuff. The uh, You would talk to the producer. Um, I mean, it seems like everything's, you know, moving forward and, and yours, yours is moving forward faster than any, anything I'm working on. So that's why I was like, hey, let's let's talk like let's do a podcast. Yeah, I was I was surprised that Vlad TV hit me up um right i wasn't wasn't expecting that at all well you know but, it's uh, funny because you had mentioned vlad to me and then then before i because you, you were you had said something like um you'd mentioned i was going to give you their information or something i forget what happened and before any of that happened they contacted you yeah i i wonder they they, they probably contacted me through through your podcast i would think because or, you did or vlad, right? so or Danny. Oh, yeah. Or Danny. I mean, Concrete has a lot of like, you know, popular people on there, <laughs> you know, as far yeah. as like true crime. Uh, they've got some some good guests for sure. Yeah, he does a, a lot of um, he's doing more and more like conspiracy theory kind of stuff. Yeah. You know, which is, you know, he's, you know, aliens and cover-ups and he's he does a lot of that he, he's getting huge numbers though like when, yeah. when i went on there he he would he would he there would be months where he, all of his guests he was getting twenty thousand thirty thousand ten thousand like he wasn't getting big numbers now it's like every time he puts out a, a podcast he's getting two hundred thousand four hundred thousand three hundred thousand six hundred thousand it's like it's it's it, his his thing's blowing up <clears throat> Yeah, my, I I think know. my interview got three, has like 300,000, I think. Yeah, if he redid that interview now, it'd probably get 600,000. Like, like if I asked Danny to go on his podcast right now, like, hey, man, I'm going to come by and I, let's do a podcast. I, he'd probably say no. He'd probably really? listen, I'm I'm big shot now. I, <laughs> I don't, you're small fry. So, but um, you, you yeah, were going concrete like every couple weeks, it seemed like for a while there. You know, you, I was he would regular. Yeah, I was, but I, I really do I really do feel like he's getting so big that um and he has to be raking in the money. Like, I mean, I know what the numbers numbers are, and he doesn't do short podcasts, he does two hours, three hours. Mm -hmm. So you put out those podcasts and you get four hundred thousand views, you're making a ton of money. That, those are five, ten, fifteen thousand dollar podcasts at that point. So, and there was a time when I first, probably the first year that I was going on, uh, um, concrete. The probably the first year there were times when he was like, you know, bro, I'm I'm struggling, but he, you know, he pushed through it because you know, listen, you start it, it sucks. There are times it just sucks, like nobody's watching. <laughs> like, well, I'm just talking. I'm talking to. I got like 12 friends that watch this out of pity. That's what I'm talking <laughs> to right now. It's it's that bad. And then one day it picks up and picks up, and you know. So I think he's doing great. I'd be yeah. thrilled with those numbers. Hell yeah! I'm trying to get my YouTube channel even monetized right now. <laughs> you know what I mean? Well, I just put out. <clears throat> I put a TikTok out. Uh, like two days ago, and it's got like 80,000 80, views and something. 
I'm surprised at that. Your take? Oh, that's what I was going to say. Did you ever send the producer? Did you ever send him the the little shorts I did on you? Uh, I think he's I think he's seen them because I posted them on Instagram. I want to say because um, th those are almost those are almost like sizzle reels. Yeah, you did a good job on on all those. They're, Yours? They're edited. I'd oh, like yeah, to ask you how did you how, how did you find the clip like obviously the clips that you put in there are from like famous movies but like i mean what's the process of like getting because uh, the clips relate to what the people are saying so well you know what i mean well with yours you know there was only really one counterfeiting movie that was perfect for you that was to, to live and die in la yeah like that was perfect now you you said you would watch the movie after that right yeah yeah I mean, it, it was, it, it's great. Like the guy, the manufacturing process, all the stuff he goes through. It, it, it's, it's a great movie. And so, I mean, that was the only movie I could think to pull from. So I pulled from that and I, I might've pulled from one or two other movies, but I think that was pretty much, that was pretty much it. Oh, and the shopping, there was a bunch of shopping scenes where I said you were, where showed you guys uh, shopping. Um, those are great. You know, I wish I could play those on this. Um, just to show people, because man, they're 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 perfect. Those are perfect TikToks for you. Yeah. And that one TikTok got like it got like half a million views, and then they then TikTok censored it because for uh, showing criminal conduct. Really? Yeah, yeah. Remember, it, it, for, it got you, say, you said it was huh? like instructional or something. Yeah, you? well, yeah, in, yeah, it, like instructional for like your it's criminal conduct you're and it's you're instructing people or showing people criminal conduct yeah. does that make sense like you're not just talking about it they were concerned that it was almost like you were giving them a blueprint but it wasn't a blueprint yeah. it was just the fucking b-roll that i used from to live and die in la mm -hmm. you know it's tiktok it's just stupid um but yeah, those were those were those were great. Uh, I was gonna say, it got to like, oh, and then you know what I did? Then I ended up deleting it. I, I deleted it, not realizing that I shouldn't have deleted it. I should have made it just private. Uh, and and uh, I reposted it. And I reposted it. every time I've reposted it. It's it's gotten two three hundred thousand views, but it's never did as well as the very first the very first one. It was great. That's great. But how do they know if it's going to... That was great. I'm trying to think. That was... Uh, shoot. I'm trying to think. Where is it? Where are you? Oh, this is one right here. Oh, no, the cooperating one. The guy where he's cooperating. Yeah, the, yeah, you're right. Oh, yeah. Those are good. Yeah, you got to send those to that, to that guy. It might give him some ideas on how to do the sizzle reel. Because a yeah. sizzle reel is super important to get a decent sizzle reel down because that, that's what they're going to use to pitch, you know, larger production companies or studios. Are, is a sizzle reel typically like like something like that or is it like with act, it, like actors? It, so like, or um, it all depends. It, it depends. Like, it, like it can be exactly like what I what I did. For instance, uh, did I sent you Boziacs? Remember, you watched Boziacs for Ghetto White Boy. Yeah, yeah. He, he did you ever see like that, that one? Like, that like fucking fur coat and like all yeah, yeah. out in some mansion great. or something. <laughs> yeah, that's great. It's a great one. He's got a great sizzle reel. Yeah. And honestly, I'd love to be able to talk about like that's why I asked you like to to talk to the producer because the guys that are doing his documentary like they don't want they don't want anybody to know anything you yeah. know they don't want any social media don't talk about it don't this but he's got a great he's got an amazing sizzle reel and they've used that and they've pitched it and they've got a huge production company you know and now they're pitching other people so we can't remember. i can't even say who it is but <clears throat> it's it's super important to get a good you know a good three minute sizzle reel like i mean they don't you don't have to have actors they can just do it off of an interview You've got some great interviews, and those are, you know, those may uh, work perfectly for for them. But um, so you're working at your job, 
Mm-hmm. When, when you come um, back and you're doing the podcast, how often are you putting out stuff on your podcast? Um, what like on my channels and stuff, or yeah, I, I'm probably uh, not very often. Man, it's hard to find the time between because like, I'm writing the book, um, as well. I'm I'm working, um, and then I travel like it seems like once a month or so oh, for a to do podcast? different podcasts. Yeah. So, so you were on like you were on Vlad, Vlad mm-hmm. mine. Um, Concrete. Concrete. I've done, uh, I just did MSCS Media uh, right. two days ago. Um, crime and Entertainment. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah. A bunch of the other smaller ones that, um, but yeah, I just got some, uh, some, somebody commented on my YouTube page saying about No Jumper. Have you, uh, you know, No Jumper? Um, a kind bunch of, of guys kind of like a, a hip hop type uh, interviews like rappers and so it's kind of like Vlad TV. Yeah, yeah. I've guys have mentioned it to me. I've never reached out to them. I could, I don't know. I I think actually I think Tyler, I think Tyler has reached out to them and they've never. You know, they just may not be interested. I'm not. I'm not everybody's cup of tea. <laughs> yeah. So you know. Um, did you ever do uh Julian's? Not yet. He uh he messaged me on Instagram saying he wanted me to come uh like the first of next year. So probably January, February, or something like that. Yeah, um, his is uh um Trendafinder. Is it Trendafinder? Trendafire, 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 Fire, Trendafire. Yeah. I always say it wrong. I mean, you, you're making up when you're making up words, you know, it's going to be hard. So I can barely read English. So, so yeah, Julian's got, he, and he's, he'll do, he'll do, he'll talk to you for four hours. Yeah. Yeah. He seems like a smart, a smart guy for sure. I I saw his, uh, interview on concrete. I never heard of him until that concrete, uh, interview he did. And, uh, yeah, he just seems smart. So I checked out his channel and, uh, you know, I watch his stuff every now and then too. So. Yeah, he, um, he, you know, he had a, he had a, a, a super successful career ahead of him. And then just suddenly, and then just kind of, it, it was at, he said, he was at that point where it was like, if I take this, they offered him a position and it was like, if I take this position, I'll never be able to back my way out of this course that my, the trajectory, his life was was headed on and he was like i was i wasn't happy and he said and i just kind of decided you know what that this is something i want to do and i want to be i want to do podcasts and and he quit he quit a job that was probably going to be making three four hundred thousand dollars a year and quit it to start a podcast yeah i mean that's like working on wall street or like exactly yeah investment banker or something exactly yeah i mean you have to admit that's a huge that's a you got to be committed to say hey you know what i'm i'm not i'm not going to do this like i'm not going to end up getting stuck in this rut that i don't like like i'm sure there are people that love it but he knew he knew he didn't love it and he said this is something that i want to do that i want to pursue and this is what i want my life to be about and and he went for it i mean that's most people don't realize that until it's it's way too late and they got two kids a massive mortgage, a wife they can't stand. They're teaching little league, you know. And then suddenly they realize I hate my job and I can't quit because I I have all these obligations. Then he just decided that I'm not going to allow myself to get in that position. So I I always thought that was super was really really cool. Uh, uh, you know that 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 in and of itself is a story. Like you've got a story, I have a story, but. But he he's that's also a story. Yeah, for sure. You know, you and, and I were go ahead. It's crazy how accessible the internet is. Like, you know what I mean? How how easy it is. It's not easy, but like anybody can become a famous rapper or a talk show host or whatever, you know, but with like YouTube and SoundCloud, all these different platforms. You know what I mean? You used to have to like get in with these record labels or 
you know, production companies and stuff. Now you can literally post a video and, you know, if it blows up, it blows up and you're, you know, you can make a living off of it. Yeah. It's pretty look, crazy. Look, I, I got this, like my studio, I just redid my studio a little bit, not a lot. I tweaked it since you've been here. It was a lot bigger. And I mean, I, did you ever see the closet that I, I put this stuff I put the the foam stuff in the closet. It's wrapped all around the closet. Mm -mm. Yeah, inside, I took a closet where you could actually sit down. It's got a platform. It's sit down, put your laptop. I've got the mic, everything. You close it, and it is, it's a perfect sound studio. And I, the other day, when I was working with this production company in, in the UK, they sent me a script, and they said, can you please record this script and then they started trying to explain to me like you're gonna you may have to do this and do that and 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 i was like no 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 listen I, i'm done i got all that like i i and i recorded it on garage band in that room and sent it to them and they were like this is this is amazing like the quality is amazing like that's what the, and it's it's to your point where any any goofball can download garage band and go stand inside their closet and record and it, it sounds like you were in a fucking professional yeah. studio it sounds that good that's just how amazing all the equipment is out here and then it just yeah. boils down to are you talented and are you lucky yeah because you could sure. be super talented and still not get found it's a combination of talent and luck yeah it seems like it seems like uh with the whole posting on social media, it's like about consistency. You know I mean? If you just post, uh, you know, nonstop every week or every day or whatever, like eventually followers add up, you yeah, know what it, I mean? Well, it's going to catch up. Yeah. Event like people don't typically like unfollow you for any reason. So, I mean, the more you post it just, eventually it just, you know, it's stacks well, up eventually. You know, and then it's just a matter of, do you happen to put out that one video that people go, wow, like I'm going to share, I'm sending this to five of my friends. Like, this is amazing. And, and then next thing you know, that video does really well and you get even more subscribers and then it's kind of starts to take off. Like, like I, I, you know, my subscriber rate is not huge, but it's fairly consistent. And so for me, I already, I know that it's just a matter of hanging on long enough until the numbers can support me. And the moment they can support me and I can drop some of the other things I'm doing, I'll double down on, on the content. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like I can't afford it. I have to do other things to, to pay my bills. YouTube doesn't do that for me right now, but it's start, it's getting there. And at yeah. some point it will get there and that then it'll be fuck. Then it'll be, man, it, it, you know, it'll, it'll be amazing. Cause then I'll be able to double down and say, okay, now I can really make this full time. You thought I was putting out content before. Like now I can really fucking lean into it. I can't do that now. Yeah. You know, I'll get a fucking evicted. I owe this guy rent every month. I got to pay. They'll take my car. The bank, the bank keeps still sending me these statements that they tell me, you, gotta, you know, like they're not going to be like, no, no, listen, I got a plan. I got to double down. They'd be like, yeah, you fucking figure that out later. So, yeah, yeah I'd say I'm a year or two away from that. Shit. How, how many subscribers do you have on YouTube now? You got like, you had like 50,000 a while ago, didn't you? Yeah. Are you still, like, still at 50,000? Yeah, it's like 57,000. I'm getting like whatever, fourteen hundred a month at this point. So, two months from now it'll be, two months from now it'll be at you know what, sixty. Yeah. Which you know is, you know that's like, you know it's not Danny, it's not you know single, it's not fifty thousand or twenty thousand a month, but it's for me it's yeah. I'm thrilled with that. You just got out of prison, though, like two years ago, didn't you? <laughs> You're doing great, bro. I, that's what I'm saying. I'm doing great. I, I really am doing great. Listen, yeah. two years ago, I was living in somebody's closet. Not mm -hmm. even like the spare room. Like my bed was in the closet. 
there was a big <laughs> closet. I actually stuck my bed in there so I'd have more room. Um, yeah. So, I mean, I literally, I was living in someone like spare room, you know, two years ago. So, you know, I'm thrilled. I'm thrilled. Oh, yeah. What's up with, uh, are you still writing people's stories? Or was yeah, that I'm, just kind of something you, you did in prison? No, I, I am. I don't, you know, what happens is I keep getting sidetracked. I just finished, I just, I'd written a book or I wrote a book. Partially wrote a book in prison. I finished it. I had a couple half kind of partial projects. So I just finished this one book. And I'm kind of breaking it apart now to kind of turn it into like a, so that it could be turned into a documentary very easily. So that's one project. I'm almost done with that. And I'm then going to work. I'm working on Jess's story, my girlfriend mm -hmm. um, or my fiance, her story. So um, I started writing that, but, you know, she doesn't know, like most people, they only know her, their version of the crime. So we ordered the, the criminal records and arrest records of as many of her co-defendants as we could get. So I, I ordered, I did Freedom of Information Act, I got those in. And that's a nice little pile now. And it's funny, too, because stuff would come in from her where she was like, oh, wow, I forgot about that. That's right. So, you know, they're helping to remind her of things and, and dates. You know, people don't know the dates. You don't know the name of the officer. You don't know. So we've got a nice little pile and I, I'm going to write her story. It's going to be, you know, it's going to be a probably, I don't know probably 10,000 words, maybe, maybe 12,000. I'll put it on the website. And then I have another story that my buddy uh, Pete and I work on, uh, and he's in prison. Uh, we work on a story. It's, I call it, you know, it's, it's called The Company. And it's about a, I've talked about it several times over the, la over the last year or two. It's about a, a bunch of guys that were robbing uh, computer or chip manufacturers. They were making computer chips back in like the 80s and 90s. And so it's it's a group of Asian, you know, gang members. They were that were that were being hired by people from China and Shanghai to rob chip manufacturers in the United States. And then they would ship the chips back to China and they put them in the computers and sell them back to us. <laughs> so. Yeah, it is. It's a it's an insane story. And especially with, you know, China and just ev everything that's going on right now. So it's it's a super interesting story, but I haven't had time. It, it's like the outline is there. It's a matter of me sitting down and writing the actual stories. But I'm close to I want to finish Jess's and then I want to work on that one. Yeah, but, you Where know, it's still at, at, what? in California or something, the Chinese gang. Yeah, they were, it was, they were, uh, um, what do they call them? They're, they're called the, it's a triad, it's the triad, triad. Yeah. Yeah. It's out of China, but they were robbing places all throughout the United States. Hmm. So it wasn't just Silicon, Silicon Valley. It was, they were robbing places in like Idaho and, you know, uh, you know, um, you know, Kansas and these places that were making chips, you know, and getting in, you know, Intel chips and, you know, and it, and it literally, I mean, it's it's super like spy stuff. Like they're showing up in a van with a hundred and twenty thousand chips in the van, and a guy's giving them a briefcase for five thousand or five million dollars in cash for twenty million dollars in chips, and they just pull up in the van and get the briefcase. He gets in the van, they get in a car, and they drive their separate ways. I mean, it's and these are like Chinese officials. Yeah. It's an amazing story. What's great is that, you know, we ordered all the documents. The problem, the reason it took so long to get to the point where I am now is that COVID, because of COVID, they had shut down the archives. So we weren't able to get the transcripts that we wanted because they were in the archives. So hmm. it, eventually we ended up, you know, they opened it back up. It, they actually, actually, Pete has a friend, a girlfriend who has a friend that was dating a judge 
in San Francisco, and he got the guy from the archives to go down there and pull all the documents for us. I mean, that's you know, that in and of itself, that's cool. That's a great story. Like, who can say that? In the middle of COVID, we got a friend of a friend who who's dating a judge. Get the, and the judge calls down and says, "Get out of bed. Go down there. Get these people their fucking documents." I mean, that's great. <laughs> yeah, that that's should awesome. be in the story. Hell yeah. But yeah, I think um, that would be an interesting story. Does it ever get made? I don't. I don't know. I mean, I wake up at sometimes. I wake up at two, three in the morning, and I'll get up and I'll come downstairs and I'll write for two hours and. You know, I might do that once or twice a, a week. And so, it, you know, it's just it's little things. It, you know how it, you write a page here, a page there, a page here. And one day you'll turn around and you'll go, holy shit. I'm, not, I'm done. Like this is, yeah. it, it, you know, but, but it takes a long time, though. I've been writing for like six months now. <laughs> and yeah. I'm, uh, I'm probably like six chapters in, maybe five, five chapters. Yeah, we get, um, that's the problem. You got a job. Yeah, that's, you know? that's what it is. Yeah, I you're not a professional five, writer. Eat something till six, you know, and then it's like, yeah, you can only write like a paragraph a night. And that's even if I have time to do that every night. So I need, yeah, I need have, to focus on it more, though. I, I want to finish the book for sure. Yeah, you have to push yourself, you know, even if it's, you know, even if you have to do it, and you, even if you do it badly you know, do something, try and do something every day because it will add up. Yeah. That, well, that's what the, the uh, director was telling me. He's like, just write it down because he's like 90% of, of writing is editing after the fact. Oh, so absolutely. Like, just get, it, get it on paper. And then from there, it's like, it's just doing the work. You know what I mean? It's just fixing this, fixing that, switching this around. You know? Yeah. The hardest thing is, is looking at that blank page. And putting something mm -hmm. down. Once it's down, you can fuck with it. You can, you can, you can, you can fix it later. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I need to start start writing more. But I'm, man, it's it seems like with with the pod, like in in the past like month or so, a, a bunch of other podcasts have hit me up. It seems so. It's like I've I've done two podcasts this week already, plus working, and you know what I mean. But it's good to stay busy, though. I you know. Well, and if you had a book out there, then those would be every time you do a podcast, you're going to sell some books. You're not going to sell hundreds, but you're going to sell. doesn't matter if you sell 10. Yeah. That's 60 or 70 bucks, you know, mm -hmm. and that and the residual that comes in, you know, as people see the older podcast and then every once in a while you do a podcast and it gets a couple hundred thousand views and then you, you do sell a hundred bucks. I mean, you're making it. You, you do it on Amazon, you'll make six fifty to seven seven dollars and fifty cents a book. Is that I mean, through self publishing? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, you could make more, but if you want to price it reasonably, my book's reasonably priced. It's like twenty bucks. Yeah. So it makes me like it depends on wh where you buy it, but it's like between six fifty and seven dollars and fifty cents per book. I mean, you know, that's so. pretty good though. You yeah. can sell 10,000 copies of that. Shit, that's <laughs> yeah. Yeah, have don't I wish. Um <laughs> but yeah, it's it yeah, it's happening. So you just got to keep you just got to keep hammering away at it. For sure. Hey, uh I appreciate you guys watching. I'm going to go ahead and, and we're going to put Jeff's um his interview, not his interview with me because I didn't do a great interview. Just an interview with Jeff telling his story uh you know, in his own words uh, that I have on Inside the Darkness, which is my my uh, other channel. And we're going to I'll have uh, Colby's going to load the the interview uh, on the back of this. So if you want to watch Jeff's story told by him, it's a really interesting story. Um, it, yeah, it, it's a it's it's great. So check it out. And I appreciate you guys watching and do me a favor if. You know, if you like the video, subscribe, hit the link, you know, all that. Also, I have Patreon. If you want to see me do uh, create content that you, you know, you want to see, uh, most of my content is better than, you know, this, this anyway. Um, but then, then this interview, um, just because I just wanted to catch up. And uh, so do me a favor and go to my Patreon. Uh, you know, you can subscribe to Patreon for 10 bucks. Uh, also, if you want to, you can thank, uh, you can support the channel by thanking me. There's a scroll button below 
below this video and there's a little thank you. It's a dollar sign and you can thank, you know, you can leave a dollar ninety nine, four dollars and ninety nine cents, forty nine ninety nine, whatever you want to leave. I appreciate it. And check out Jeff's uh, check out Jeff's interview. Uh, my name is Jeff Turner. I'm 35 years old. <clears throat> I just got out of uh, federal prison for conspiracy to counterfeit U.S. obligations. Um, so Where yeah, were you born? Uh, I was born in outside of Miami. I grew up in uh, Clearwater, St. Pete, Tampa Bay area. Um, I've lived in Knoxville, Tennessee for about the past eight years. Um, kind of... Uh, started uh, counterfeiting at a at a younger age um, when I was about 19 or 20 years old um, making hundred dollar bills um, I'd sell sell them in bulk to uh, one of my friends father's friend um, and did that for about six months um, until my my friend overdosed and died, which kind of severed that connection. So that I decided to stop for many years. Um, and let's see, probably about 2018, I started doing it again, uh, kind of out of desperation in Knoxville. <clears throat> um, so <clears throat> I was working for a, a sign company, and I basically lost my job like two months before the lease was up in my in my house. Um, so I decided to get back into the counterfeiting thing. Um, uh, I met uh, a guy I worked with um, and he, he turned out to be like a pretty big drug dealer um, dealing in like multiple different, you know, heroin, meth, methamphetamines, cocaine, you know, marijuana, all, all, all sorts of stuff. Um, so I, I began selling him money so he could go to Atlanta from Knoxville and re-up with drugs with with partially my counterfeit money and some of his real money and all that but um so Knoxville is is a weird city it's kind of like uh so many people come from other major cities down to Knoxville specifically for some reason to to sell drugs um a lot of people from Chicago Detroit Cleveland, Atlanta. I, f I feel like the big cities have so much competition that these these drug dealers are branching out and going to these mid level cities because there's a lot of uh, money there and drug addicts everywhere in Knoxville. So um, this this one in particular was from well he's from California but he was he was buying dope in Atlanta and selling it in Knoxville. So um, you know. He was doing, I was giving him probably five, 10,000 at a time at first, um, with twenties, some fifties and hundreds. Um, but eventually the, the twenties and fifties just didn't make sense. I mean, to, you know, to maximize profits, you might as well just do the hundreds. So I kind of stopped messing with the twenties and the fifties. Um, I was doing the 96 series, a hundred dollar bill. Um, which, uh, you know, has, let's see, a number of security features. It's got, uh, they've got counterfeit detection pens. They're iodine-based ink, so, you know, to mark the bill to, to determine if it's counterfeit or not. Well, I found a way around, around that. Um, but also there's a, a strip embedded in the bill, a watermark, um, color-shifting ink in the corner, and... Uh, See the the embedded strip glows red in a black light for hundred dollar bills, um, and I was able to to crack all of those security features um, pretty flawlessly. Um, so the the one drug deal I started selling to ended up getting arrested uh, for drug charges, which they they found counterfeit money my counterfeit money on him, but um, he was he was set up by somebody he was selling to. His house was raided. They found my bills. Um, it kind of spooked me because I thought he might might be cooperating. Um, so the lease was up in my house. So me and my wife and uh, kids started staying out of hotels. Um, and I kind of just went all in with the counterfeiting thing uh, to, to, you know, support my family, support my, my drug addiction. 
and you know make extra money so uh, I started just uh, spending the bills and I mean I was selling them to, to different drug dealers ripping off drug dealers with them um, uh, but I started going to stores and spending them and they they passed every time which I, at first I was nervous about but by the time I passed maybe five or six of them and there was never an issue that everyone would hold them up, look at the strip, watermark, mark it with a pen, and they they always passed flawlessly. So I kind of got cocky with it and started, my wife and I would go on, uh, you know, shopping sprees, go on road trips to different cities, um, down to Atlanta, Chattanooga, in Knoxville, all around Knoxville, Lexington, Kentucky, Cleveland, Ohio, uh, you know, make road trips, spend spend about a week or two in a city and just our job was to shop go spend spend money you know what i mean break break these bills convert the counterfeit money into legitimate money and there, there were different ways we'd do it um not only selling selling uh, counterfeit to drug dealers in bulk for you know 25 cents on the dollar so for for ten thousand dollars, they'd give me anywhere from like you know two thousand to three thousand, averaging at about twenty five hundred. Um, but we'd also buy prepaid Visa cards um, with the the three ninety nine fee on a hundred dollar prepaid Visa card. I'd give two fake hundred dollar bills and get you know a hundred dollar prepaid Visa card and ninety five dollars change or whatever it may be. And if you go into a Walmart or and you can you can go to multiple registers because the registers are so spread out. You can go to the electronic center, the garden center, one or two registers up front, and and easily leave a Walmart with like a thousand dollars cash and a thousand dollars worth of prepaid Visa cards. There's also like uh, buying money orders. You know, uh, I tried to keep it at just a few hundred dollars a piece. Sometimes we got up to like almost a thousand, but I didn't want too much suspicion. But you can go to, uh, you know, a, a Walgreens, a CVS, buy a $500 money order. And just that was that was what we did all day, every day. It was driving around to different businesses. Um, we probably have been to every business, every, every corporate business. I didn't go to like mom and pop stores um, ever. I tried not to. It would always be, you know, the big corporate uh, chains. But in different... Um, different chains have kind of different ways that they detect the money. So if you, if you go into a Walmart with someone else and you can each hit up a couple of different registers, we'd go in like two or three of us at a time and each go buy like a, I'd buy like a little $2 birthday card, like happy birthday niece or whatever, and a hundred dollar prepaid visa card to kind of give it the appearance I was buying a present for somebody. Um, and if, you know, say two or three of us, say three went into Walmart, um, and each, each went to two different registers, you know, uh, we could easily leave with, you know, $1,200 worth of Visa cards, cash, whatever. Um, there was one case where we, uh, knew, a, a manager at a, a certain gas station that just opened the safe and just switched out real money for counterfeit money. And I think we got like three or four grand for that one. Um, there was all sorts of different, different schemes of, you know, a lot of the drug dealers that I would, uh, I'd start off just buying heroin from them. Um, you know, kind of ripping them off 500 bucks here, 500 bucks there. Um, and then typically after, you know, five grand worth or something, they, they'd kind of get wise to it, uh, one way or the other. And, uh, they were, I've had a few cases where the guys weren't very happy and had to, you know, avoid phone calls or whatever, but most of them were able to use that money and re-up with their dope or, you know, just spend it and it, it always worked. So they weren't typically even mad. They would just then want to, you know, do business with me and, and buy them. They wanted to continue getting them just at a discounted rate because they knew they're fake now. Um, so I had probably, I'd say eight or 10 drug dealers that were, you know, moving kilos at a time, buying, uh, say maybe 10 to 15,000 worth of counterfeit money every month. 
at least every month. So, so everybody, like I said, they'd come from Detroit or Cleveland to Knoxville to sell drugs. So they'd obviously re up their, their plugs were in Detroit or Cleveland or whatever. So once a month, people would usually drive up 75, go to Detroit, say, buy a, a kilo of heroin, drive down to Knoxville, you know, cut that kilo to two or whatever, sell it. And they do that once a month. So when it came time for them to, to go up uh, to Detroit or Atlanta or, you know, wherever, uh, you know, they'd, they'd want, 10 extra thousand dollars of counterfeit money to mix in with their, you know, 40,000 real or whatever. And it just, you know, it was a way for them to make extra money. And, um, you know, there was, uh, one guy who I was actually, it was the only guy that I was straight, straight up with off rip. Like as soon as I met him, I wanted to just tell him cause he had really high quality fentanyl at the time. Um, and, uh, so I came out with him uh, up front that the bills were fake. I didn't try to rip him off or anything like that. And I'm glad I didn't because he like just got out of prison for 25 years for murder. And he was like a high ranking vice lord from Detroit. But uh, so I just I asked him to buy like a gram or at first or whatever. And I, I hand him a hundred dollar bill and he was like, OK, cool. And I, I kind of was like, are you sure we're good? You know what I mean? Like, take, take a look at that. And eventually he kind of realized he was holding it up. He's like, what is this fake? What are you talking about? And, you know, I said, I'm like, yeah, that's fake. And, you know, it's kind of up front with him. So he, he was like, yeah, oh, does it mark with a pen though? And I said, yeah, of course. So he's like, come with me and takes me to this uh, hotel room that we were staying at. And uh, I walk in there and it's just full of like, eight to ten fucking high-ranking vice lord fucking gangsters tattoos on their faces and this and that and shit um and they were all blown away that the shit looked as as good as they were passed all the tests all that shit so i started dealing with uh, a few from that group pretty regularly um that was actually the day i got arrested i was making an order for them the, the detroit vice lords um I think they ordered like 6,000 and I was, I was printing that up in my hotel room the day that, that I got arrested. Um, but leading up to my arrest, uh, there was, there was one drug dealer in particular from Cleveland that, um, I, uh, I, I ripped him off for probably five to 10,000 here and there, just 500 at a time, you know, buying eight balls of heroin or whatever from him just for personal use. Uh, Eventually, I guess he had a wad of money and one of my bills was on the outside and it was raining. So the, the color shifting ink soaked off of the bill. So that's how we found out that they were fake. Um, and I, I came home one day and he was in my driveway. So I thought like, uh, well, there's going to be a problem, you know, but he basically was just uh, talking to my roommate at the time saying like, oh, I just want to know where you got these bills because I want more of them. I want more of them. So I started doing business with him. Um, I think I paid him back a little bit for what I had ripped off from him. I think I probably gave him like a thousand dollars in fake money for free just because to squash any beef that he had with it. But he was cool with it. We started, uh, going up to Cleveland together and I, he would pick up, you know, uh, usually about a half kilo or a kilo of heroin while I was driving around, uh, Cleveland just breaking bills you know every new city is a new opportunity because I I traveled around Knoxville area so much that I'd been to like every business every corporate business in Knoxville multiple times and it kind of eventually they get wise to it because even if it passes at the register eventually that bill will hit the bank and and the store will find out that the money's fake so after you go to a place two or three times it you know kind of exhaust the resources. Um, so the guy, uh, up in, up in Cleveland, I was doing business with pretty, pretty frequently. We had kind of a, he was, he was the only co-defendant, uh, co-conspirator on my case. Actually, he's the one that, that set me up and ultimately led to my arrest. But, um, so I, the way I was making the bills was using Bible paper. Um, so there's like, there's multiple steps in the process for each bill. So, um, basically I'd, uh, you, you can't scan 
a hundred dollar bill or you can't print just the image of a hundred dollar bill because the, the printer will recognize the image and it'll shut it down and it only it only prints like a little portion before it recognizes it so i would um i would get a high resolution camera and take a picture of the bill and upload that photo which allowed me to create the the digital image of the bill um go on like adobe photoshop or paint.net and and layer that image to i did it with three three layers on the front of the bill two layers on the back of the bill as well as a, a layer for the strip and the watermark. So I would uh, tape a piece of Bible paper onto a regular piece of printer paper because the, the Bible paper was too thin. It would jam up in the printer. So you had to, to tape it to a regular piece. And then I would print the background color um, and then the, the green treasury seal and serial numbers, which the serial numbers I changed I had 24, not on all of them, but I had 25 templates of serial numbers. So if I was printing uh, $2,500 bills, each one would have its own own serial number. Um, so eventually they were multiplied serial numbers, but I never, I tried to never keep in my possession bills with the same serial number. Um, so, you know, you print the background color, the, the treasury seal and serial number, the black work, um, and then on the, the back of the bill, the, I'd print the background color and the back of the, the image of the back of the bill. And then I'd, I'd take scissors and cut a hole in the back of the, the printer paper to, uh, access, to be able to print on the, the back of the back to print the, the strip and a watermark. Um, and once everything was printed, I would, <clears throat> I had, a a little setup with a piece of glass with LED lights under it to, to make it to where you could see through the bills. Um, so I'd, I'd spray a, a light coat of like a Gorilla Glue adhesive and put the, the back of the bill on the glass so I could line up <clears throat> the, the front and the back so they were evenly and proportioned and then, you know, squeegee them together. Um, and then I would spray spray it with a thick coat of matte lacquer, um, which basically made the counterfeit detection pens not work on them. It made them pass the, for, for legitimate because <clears throat> you're creating a, uh, a barrier in between the paper. So, so the iodine counterfeit pen couldn't react with the paper because it was coated with lacquer. Um, and then, you, you know, you spray a thick coat of it first and then Secondly, you, you let that dry and spray another coat from a distance, which, which misted the lacquer on to create a, a texture that, that felt perfectly like money. Um, <clears throat> and, uh, I used, uh, an iridescent green eyeshadow pigment to, uh, to make the color shifting effect on the bills. So I, the little 100 in the corner, I'd print as black. And then you go over that with uh, the iridescent color shifting green eyeshadow in it. And it went from a metallic green to as you tilt the bill to the, the black colored. Um, and I uh, found online these little, they're called invisible ink UV pens, which are kind of marketed for um, like little girl's diaries or something like you can write in your diary and it's invisible to, you know, unless you shine a black light on it. So I found these pens specifically in red. <clears throat> so after the bill was glued together and sprayed with lacquer and I put the color shifting pigment on, on the 100 in the corner, I would put a ruler over the, where the strip was and I'd draw a line with this invisible ink UV pen to make it to where if they ever put it in a black light or had a, a black light on the back of the counterfeit pen, the strip would appear to glow red, just like, you know, real, real bills. Um, and I also went through, like I was always experimenting with different methods, trying to advance the bills. I was constantly on Adobe Photoshop, sharpening the images and, um, I, I found this one, it's like a ballpoint pen with, like a, an adhesive in it. It's like a glue pen, but it's really fine pointed. So I found if where the, the president's shirt is on the image, you could take this pen and just draw some little lines and it was invisible. It was just a clear adhesive, 
but it would give that texture because some people, they say scratch the shirt. It's feeling for the texture on the, uh, like the, the, sh the shirt of the bill because real money is printed on an intaglio press, which is high pressure and, and the ink actually stands above the paper. It doesn't absorb into it. So money has a texture to it. So, you know, I, I went through that. I, I almost, uh, like I was always experimenting with different methods, trying to improve the bills. Um, my kind of ultimate goal was to allow the bills to go into machines like, uh, self checkout machines, vending machines. That way I could just go into a Walmart and buy a thousand dollar TV in a self checkout and then just return it. You know what I mean? I, I wanted the bills to pass. And if, if the magnetic, if there was magnetic ink on my bills, they'd pass at the bank through their money counters. So that was kind of my ultimate goal was to pass, let them pass in the bank. Cause that's ultimately how they got caught was at the bank. But there's a, uh, a method of like, so in, in a laser printer, like businesses can print their own checks from home and you can buy toner cartridges that are MICR. It's magnetic ink character recognition. So it's basically magnetic toner and it's, it's sold to for businesses to print their own checks with the routing number and account number on the bottom. That way they, the checks read in the machines. So I found this out and I, I was planning to print my black work of the bills with MICR toner, which would then make them magnetic and would go through bill validators, self checkout machines, you know, money counters at the bank, all that, which, uh, I, I toyed with and I was about to start doing, but it was hard to edit the image. Uh, so like when you print with a laser printer, that background design behind the president's portrait is, is in such a fine, uh, like resolution that laser printers usually create this wavy effect behind the president's portrait, which was the only problem. Other, uh, besides that, the bills looked perfect with magnetic ink, but that it was hard to, to edit the image. And I was kind of in the process of doing that by the time I got arrested, as well as uh, printing the new blue, blue note with the blue uh, strip. And, um, I found out how to counterfeit the new blue notes. Um, basically all the security features on the, the new blue notes are the same as the old security features with like, there's a color shifting, uh, like bell little, you know, image and then the counter shifting or color shifting, uh, 100. And there are different color shifts. It goes from a copper to green instead of green to black, but it's the same technology. Essentially. I found a, uh, kind of a mix of pigments and nail polishes actually to create that copper to green color shifting effect. Um, it's like a chameleon, a certain kind of chameleon nail polish mixed with a, uh, a, it was, I think a gold to green color shifting pigment and you mix those two together and it creates the perfect, uh, copper to green color shifting effect. Um, but the, the difference with the blue notes is that, that blue strip down it, um, so I was trying to figure out how to, you know, counterfeit that blue strip and doing a bunch of research over months, like eventually found that. So the, the company that actually makes money for the federal government, it's, it's contracted through the uh, Bureau of Engraving and Printing. And then they contract out the, this company, Crane and Company, um, for all the paper craning company has been selling uh, mint paper to the government for money for like hundreds of years. It's been the same company. So with the blue strip, this company craning company patented that information. Um, and I was able to find the patent on Google patents. It's under, uh, I believe it's, it's motion. I think it's the craning company's lenticular motion. So <clears throat> that, that technology I found is basically just, um, like it's a lenticular, like the old, uh, like last supper things that like the pictures that move as you go from right to left, that's like an old school version of lenticulars. It's little lenses and strips that the image changes as you move it. But this new method is basically the same concept, except it's instead of long lenses on, on this film, it's like a honeycomb pattern of like microscopic little honeycomb lenses. So as you move 
this print from left to right, the honeycomb lenses different images that you print underneath it. So it's basically just like this really clear textured sticker that you can put over a print to create that effect. So I found two different companies online that actually sold, it's called Fly Eye Lenticular Lens Film. Um, and there's two companies I found, DP Lenticulars and Microlux that sold Fly Eye Lenticular Lens Film that is like, I think it was 30 microns thick, super thin. It's exactly the stuff that they use to uh, actually make the blue strips in the, uh, the new $100 bills. So I was in the process of doing that and ordering certain things uh, as I got arrested. But again, I kind of had the, uh, if it's not broke, don't fix it mentality. The bills that I were making, the 96 series, were passing without a problem everywhere I went. So... I wasn't in any rush to kind of change with the magnetic toner or the, the new blue notes. I mean, it was easily working, you know, with the old way. So I kind of wasn't in a rush, but I was still aspiring to, to print the new blue notes with, with magnetic ink, color shifting ink, UV, you know, all the security features on the new blue note. That way they could potentially pass at the bank if that was magnetic ink. Um, but, uh, ultimately after, you know, I think uh, the Secret Service said, last I heard from them on it, they, they were saying that they found $380,000 that I spent throughout Knoxville. Um, they were still finding about 10000 a week at the time, which was years ago. So I, I believe the, the ultimate number that I printed was probably around seven to $800,000 in the course of the, the conspiracy, which took about 18 months, two years. Um, so the, the, the Cleveland drug dealer guy that I mentioned earlier was, uh, going up to, to Cleveland to, to buy a kilo of heroin. And, uh, he, I guess he, he bought a car from somebody. He bought like a 2000, what was it? Nine, 2010 charger for $500 and an eight ball. So <laughs> I knew it was a stolen car, obviously, but he, the guy that sold it to him had the title, so he thought it was legitimate. I knew it was stolen because that's just, you know, not realistic, but he went up to Cleveland in that car and got pulled over because, of course, it was stolen. Um, and they found on him, uh, I think it was $20,000 in real cash and 5000 in fake $100 bills that I, I had sold him to, to re up in, up in Cleveland. Um, he then decided to, to cooperate with the Cleveland Secret Service. So the, the Cleveland Secret Service basically said, we won't charge you for this counterfeit money if you, if you set up your supplier in Knoxville, Tennessee. He agreed to that. Um, he also admitted to his own drug conspiracies and things he was doing that I, I wasn't involved with. But as far as the, the counterfeiting conspiracy, he, Basically, they let him out of jail and drove him down to Knoxville. Um, I got tipped off that he got arrested <clears throat> by uh, this girl that was running drugs for him. Kind of told me one day, uh, she's like, you know, e he's up in jail up in Cleveland. He told me not to tell anybody, which was a huge red flag for me, obviously, because, you know, there's only one reason why he wouldn't want anyone to know he was he was incarcerated. Um, so basically I, uh, you know, packed up my stuff and started staying at a different hotels to kind of avoid the, the heat that I, I sensed was coming down on me. Um, and he called me, uh, maybe a week after that. Um, he said he was back in Knoxville. Um, he had some Bible paper that, uh, that he was supposed to pick up in Cleveland for me, um, and wanted to meet up. Um, and, you know, I, I said, no, not right now. I mean, you know, I uh, was almost certain that he was cooperating and in retrospect, he was. But at the time I wasn't, you know, it was pretty obvious to me, but I wasn't 100 percent. So I shouldn't have even answered the phone when he called. But I answered the phone basically to tell him, you know, I suspect you're cooperating and I don't want to meet up with you or do business anymore. Uh, you know, in, in so little words, I wouldn't say that over the phone, but I was being very vague because I, I assumed that the phone was being tapped and it was. Um, he, uh, he basically said that he, he got arrested for the stolen car up in Cleveland 
he had to use the money that he was going to re-up with to bond out. So he's back in Knoxville. He couldn't re-up in Cleveland. So he was asking me to get him, uh, I think it was 700 grams of heroin through one of my Detroit connections. Um, which, you know, I didn't ever sell, sell drugs on that level. So, and for him to even ask me for almost a kilo of heroin over the phone is just obviously stupid. Um, so when he said that, basically at that point, he's asking me for drugs, talking about over the phone like that. I just hung up at that point. Um, but I, I guess they, they used my phone, you know, GPS pinged my phone to my location. Um, and went to the hotel parking lot I was staying at. They didn't know which room I was in, but they knew, you know, the, the vicinity of my location through GPS. So the next morning, uh, I had a, like a $6,000 order from these Detroit people. Uh, so I started printing my wife went, uh, left the hotel to go shopping. So I found out later that as soon as she left, the, you know, all these, the, the Secret Service, uh, Drug Task Force, Organized Crime Unit, KPD, swarmed her car and arrested her. Um, and then basically I was just sitting in, I didn't know this at the time, she just left to go shopping. I was printing, starting to cut some stuff and spray with lacquer, um, and I hear a knock on the door. So I looked through the peephole and it was just black. Somebody had his thumb over it. So I didn't think anybody knew, I mean, nobody, I didn't tell anybody where I was at. So I didn't think it was the police at first. Um, I figured like somebody was trying to kick the door in and rob me or something. I wasn't sure, but basically the, the thumb over the peephole, I told him just go away. You know, I don't know. I looked through the, the window in the hotel and just saw a line of, of Knox County sheriffs. <laughs> so at that point I was, you know, basically trapped in this hotel room, which sucks because we were staying out of this hotel frequently that actually had a back door. It's the only hotel I've ever found that has, you know, a way out basically. Um, and I should have been staying there, but anyway. Um, so I see all those sheriffs. I, I know, you know, they're going to raid the room, obviously. So I start trying to flush these fake hundred dollar bills down the toilet. Um, I put a handful in there, flushed it, put another handful in, went to flush it again, and the water was shut off. So I guess they they suspected that I would have, uh, you know, large quantities of heroin because uh, what the, the informant E told them, but there was no, you know, heroin in the room. But um, so they finally, you know, kick in the door, uh, arrest me um, on state, uh, state charges originally for criminal simulation over 60,000. Um, I think my bond was like a hundred thousand dollars or something like that with a bond source hearing, which means if you try to bond out, um, before you can actually bond out, you have to set up a court date and, uh, prove that the, the funds are legitimate through like bank records and all that. So, and I already knew that the secret service was there during my arrest. So I knew it was going to go federal. Um, but after about three months of uh, sitting in Knox County Jail on state charges, I went to court and, uh, you know, my public defender in the state basically said they're, they're dropping your state charges, which I knew, you know, inevitably they were going to indict me uh, in the federal jurisdiction, which they did. Um, so basically, like they, they let me out on pretrial release after about four months <clears throat> through uh, like the bail reform act that you know nonviolent white collar criminals can basically uh, get out on on pretrial so I did that um, I went to a, a rehab center got off you know got off the drugs I was on which is a blessing um, and uh, they the Secret Service came to me with a, an offer. Basically, they said, you know, E, the, the drug dealer from Cleveland that set me up, after he set me up, went on uh, went on the run. They let him go as an informant, but then he disappeared on him. Um, he got more state charges, uh, from what I've heard, for like firing a gun. They found a, a roughly like a kilo of heroin. And I think like it was a half kilo of methamphetamine or something, but 
So KPD arrested him on, on state charges and he offered to be an informant for them. They let him go and he disappeared on them. Uh, so he was wanted, even though he set me up, he was now on my indictment. Uh, he was a, the co-conspirator, co-defendant on my conspiracy case. Um, so the, the Secret Service basically came to me and said, you know, we're, we found around $400,000 of your money that you spent throughout the Eastern District of Tennessee. Uh, we'll, they said, if you, if you can plead guilty today and, and show us how you made these bills so well um, that they would keep that number at under $100,000, they wouldn't charge my wife, and I'd be looking at, uh, it was like 10 to 16 months was the, the range. Um, so of course I, you know, I took that deal. They, uh, <laughs> they flew, uh, flew a film crew. They, I think it was like the head of the head of the counterfeiting division of the secret service and investigations and, a like a film crew down to, uh, secret service headquarters in Knoxville. They had, uh, all the evidence that they seized, which they, they said was a mobile counterfeiting lab or something. I think they termed it, but you know, I had different, uh, printers, computers, um, all these different chemicals and color shifting pigments. Um, and they wanted me to basically explain everything, make money in front of the secret service on film. Uh, so they could use that as a training video for future secret service agents. Um, so, you know, I did that and, uh, ultimately it helped, helped my sentence. So I, uh, they sentenced me to, to 10 months in the uh, federal prison. Um, I did it in Lexington, Kentucky, and uh, I got out about three months ago. So I've still got three years supervised release to uh, that I'm dealing with right now. And uh, yeah, the old halfway house life now. <laughs>